In this Climate Gen episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Caitlin Norton from the British Antarctic Survey about her new research looking at the unavoidable sea level rise from West Antarctica. Although ending fossil fuels is still the main course to pursue, no amount of emissions reduction this century can slow the melt of this region of Antarctica. We discuss the implications such as abandoning coastal areas, as well as learning to accept and respond to the growing climate migrant crisis. We also discuss the psychological toll of processing this kind of scientific findings. In the next episode, I'll be speaking with author and psychoanalyst Sally Weintraub about her latest work in climate psychology. As policymakers meet in Dubai for the pre-COP discussions, it is with great sadness that we note the death of Professor Salim al Haq on the 28th of October. Salim has been a huge source of insight for my work over the last decade, giving me many interviews that provide the much-needed perspective of the vulnerable nations in the Global South. As mentioned before, my own book, Cop Out, is available for pre-order, and I'm pleased to say that Salim's wise words inform the narrative, threading the way from Paris to this year's COP in the UAE. Thank you to all YouTube and Patreon subscribers for supporting the channel. With ever more aspects of the climate and ecological crisis emerging, your support makes a difference. Hey Lynn, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me today. Thanks for having me. I wanted to start with your recent work that looked at the rate of melting on the Antarctic ice sheet, especially in the Amundsen Sea. Can you begin by giving us an overview of the role of the ocean currents and how they interact with the ice sheet? Yeah, absolutely. So this study was looking at ice shelf melting from below by the ocean. Ice shelves are the bits of the of the ice sheet around the edges which are floating. So basically an ice sheet is a system of interconnected glaciers which form when snow falls on the continent of Antarctica. It doesn't melt in the summer. Instead, it builds up over the, the years and flows downhill towards the ocean. When it hits the oceans, sometimes it doesn't stop. It keeps going for a while before it breaks off or or melts completely in the floating bit of the glacier. It's like a tongue we call it ice shelf. So we were looking at ice shelf melting in a region of West Antarctica uh, called the Amundsen Sea, where which is where we have seen uh, the most rapid changes in observations. So from satellites, you can measure ice shelf thinning rates. And we've been seeing some pretty dramatic changes in West Antarctica, especially in the Amundsen Sea. Um, this is contributing to almost all of Antarctica's uh, contribution to sea level rise. Basically, West Antarctica is losing ice rapidly. East Antarctica is gaining mass slightly. And the Antarctic Peninsula is losing mass slightly. So East Antarctica and the peninsula kind of cancel each other out. And West Antarctica is a accelerating term, um, which is causing sea level rise from the continent. So we wanted to see how this process of, of ocean driven melting uh, could change in the future, because this is very hard to model, actually, um, the interactions between the ocean and the ice shelf. So we have surprisingly few examples of uh, projections of how this could change in the future. And the projections that we do have are almost all looking at the worst case scenario of an RCP 8.5 world, which as you as you and your listeners may know, it's been a called into question whether this is even realistic because we are making progress on climate change. Our emissions probably will not follow an RCP 8.5 trajectory, but it does make us wonder how could this uh, process change in the future under other scenarios with lower fossil fuel emissions and really how much control do we still have? How much ice shelf melting can still be prevented by reducing fossil fuel use and how much is now committed? What's causing the general warming of the ocean currents? So I want to stress that we actually aren't able to observe a warming. This doesn't mean that the warming of the ocean isn't there. It means that we don't have a lot of observations. Observations of ocean temperature, really the only way to do them is to bring a ship down there to take casts of the of the seawater and to measure its properties. And this only started in 1994 in the Amundsen Sea. There's a lot of decadal variability in this region. It's very strongly influenced by El Nino and other modes of variability. So we have a very short, very patchy and very variable 
observational records. So it's entirely possible it's formed over the long term. Modeling I've been involved in has suggested the ocean has formed over the 20th century, but we can't confirm that with observations, at least not yet. It's definitely a valid explanation for why the ice shelf could be thinning, but the thinning could also be caused by um, internal ice sheet feedbacks, um, which once they get started are kind of self-perpetuating and, and could cause ice shelf thinning in the absence of ocean warming. If there has been ocean warming, modeling suggests that it's caused by an increase in the transport of warm water from the deep ocean towards the coast, up onto the continental shelf, and beneath the ice shelves. Uh, this is a warm water mass called circumpolar deep water. It's about one degree, uh, which you might not think of as warm, but Antarctic oceanographers think of as extremely warm because the ocean surface freezing point is about minus two. So that's a whole three degrees above freezing. This warm water can melt ice very quickly. And the more of it is transported towards ice shelves through ocean currents, which bring it on shore, the faster the ice shelves will melt. When we're looking forward now and we're, we're sort of seeing impacts everywhere at the moment and they're pretty worrying what does your work tell us about emissions reduction the impact that we can now have and that sort of what you mentioned in terms of control we tried to look at the full range of plausible scenarios for how emissions could change o over the rest of the century we looked at everything from the worst case scenario rcb 8.5 uh, down to a paris agreement one and a half degrees scenario where global warming is stabilized at, at one and a half degrees and also two scenarios in between RCP 4.5 and a two degrees scenario and we found that even even in the best case scenario all the scenarios in fact all of them uh, showed a rapid increase in the rate of ocean warming and ice shelf melting which sped up by about a factor of three uh, compared to uh, the 20th century. So that is some uh, pretty rapid changes in, in, in ocean temperatures and ice shelf melting, which appear to be committed. I don't think it's reasonable to expect we would do any better than a one and a half degree world because that requires net negative CO2 emissions at a scale which is far beyond what currently exists. I hope we will get there someday, but I don't think we will be there within the next few decades, which is what this scenario demands. And so that's why we use the word unavoidable. Even in the best case scenario, this baseline of rapid ocean warming seems to be committed. It doesn't mean that we've lost control forever. We started to see some flattening out of the rate of warming at the end of the century in the best case scenario, so approaching 2100. So although we didn't run simulations into next century, we think that if we did, if these scenarios were extended, we would start to have some more control. So reducing fossil fuels and scaling up uh, carbon capture technology today will have an impact eventually, but we are probably in for a century of accelerating ice shelf melting until that happens. And that's likely to be a pretty crucial time for the glaciers which are affected by ice shelf melting. You know, there's so much infrastructure that sits on the water's edge and it feels like um, that we need to be thinking about these things now because of the scale of the, because it is adaptation to, to what's coming down the track. And, and yet we don't seem to be having those societal conversations at all at the moment. I mean, exactly. is that, would you say that that's say the same from your perspective as a research? I know there is some discussion happening on the Norfolk coast of East Anglia, which is, is not too far from where I am. Area around Kings Lynn in the UK is very vulnerable to uh, uh, the storm surges. And so I believe coastal defenses are already in place, but these will have to be scaled up as the sea level rise is expanded. And some communities, some areas of the coastline will just have to be a abandoned because um, you can't build a wall around 
the entire coastline of the UK. You can defend some major cities, but it's just too expensive to to defend everywhere. This is a rich country like the UK. I worry about uh, countries like Bangladesh. Would they have the resources for such an expensive and complex engineering project as literally holding back sea level rise from densely populated areas? I I doubt it. And so I think sea level rise has the potential to cause a really major refugee crisis unless we plan for it in advance, plan global development in anticipation of how uh, coastlines will change. And that means relocating people gradually and slowly and safely instead of waiting until it's essentially too late. And that's what you're saying there is some major political issues, basically. And um, I haven't seen any political commentary on on these findings, or, or many, to be honest. If you were talking to policymakers now, what would be some key action points to be to be thinking about going forward? Because this is this is, as you say, it's already underway. Absolutely, I think um, we are already struggling with the uh, geopolitical implications of. Uh, refugees and these numbers of refugees are small in comparison to what we can expect from climate change between sea level rise as well as extreme weather and heat waves some areas of the world will essentially be uninhabitable and so we need to be having international discussions on how to deal with increasing numbers of refugees as well as every individual country thinking about uh, coastline protection and putting more focus on adaptation to sea level rise, not deciding which areas of the coast will be abandoned and which areas will have uh, coastal protection strengthened. You said that, you know, that especially in the initial period, there's nothing that we can actually do to, to change what's in play, if you like. Over the longer term, is it come, coming down to basically reducing atmospheric carbon um, and call it, you know, the sort of what we what we're all trying to do on the broader scale. Is that the ultimate um, pathway we have to we have to get onto? Yeah, ultimately, yes. Reducing fossil fuels as soon as possible, and also investing in that carbon capture technology, because the only way we can reverse climate change at the source is by removing CO two from the air. I'm not an expert on how to do that, that there are a number of different approaches, but that seems to be the direction the world is going in for an ultimate long-term solution to climate change is to first of all stop it and then reverse it. And a very interesting question, um, which I'm engaged in current research on, is if you manage to bring global temperatures down, what happens to the ice sheets? So if you have, uh, we call them overshoot scenarios if you overshoot some target like one and a half degrees or two degrees and you have a warmer climate and you have uh, changed ocean conditions warmer ocean conditions in this region but you don't have them forever ice sheets respond relatively slowly so there could be a kind of a safer period in which You can have elevated ocean temperatures, but if you cool them down in time, the glaciers will stop retreating or even even start to regrow. It's a big question on whether we are already past the point at which that ice sheet change is considered reversible, under what conditions it's reversible, and how close we are to, to this tipping point in ice sheet stability. Okay. And a lot of the geoengineering proposals, the stratospheric aerosols or cloud brightening and such, and they're much more focused on stopping the, the the radiation getting to the to the earth's surface. But if you're if you've got heat in the ocean, that's not really going to do you much good, is it if it's already in the ocean? Very hard to know. There's some very limited research on how solar geoengineering could affect Antarctica. As, uh, specifically ocean conditions on the continental shelf because they don't track cleanly with uh, global temperature. It isn't as simple as you warm up average global surface air temperatures and you warm up ocean temperatures in this region in response. It's actually 
it's a much more complicated chain of cause and effect involving winds and sea ice formation and ocean currents and solar geoengineering schemes are generally optimized for the average global surface temperature. And so there are still side effects. There are still changes to wind patterns. There are still changes to regional temperatures. So yeah, depending on the details of these schemes, which have not been well studied at all, there could be side effects which still cause dramatic changes to the ocean around Antarctica or even uh, conceivably make it worse. And if you consider that over the last century or so of intensive burning of fossil fuels, we've we've made changes to the earth. And some people say, you know, it's like an experiment itself in terms of um, what the outcome is going to be. Mm-hmm. Reversing that, trying to get back to something, it seems I, to, impossible because the rate at which we did it, it was just probably the easy bit, just burning stuff. <laughs> but uh, reversing it seems much, much bigger task. Yeah, both. I completely agree, uh, both um, economically, but also uh, geopolitically, it would require so much international cooperation. And I think we are on the pathway to reversing climate change, but slower than we need to. There are some impacts of climate change which are already unavoidable. There will be other impacts of climate change which become unavoidable in between now and whenever we bring CO2 back down, if that ever happens at all. And so there will have to be some amount of adaptation. There's one of my favorite quotes was from, I believe, John Holdren, who was the climate advisor to Barack Obama. And he said, our response to climate change will be some combination of mitigation, adaptation and suffering. The question is how much do we do of each? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I know that. Quite. Yeah, and you know, there are many people in civil society who are digesting a lot of this information, and like it's struggling to envision a future out of all of this. It becomes quite stressful, and you see it in things like the comment feeds on Twitter and so on and so forth. As a lead scientist working in this area, how do you internalize this information and? the implied consequences? Scientists are very good at part mentalizing climate change. Um, It's a very interesting physics problem. Ice sheets falling apart is a very interesting scientific problem. And it's easy to get wrapped up in all details of how it happens and the processes and, oh, isn't this cool? And why isn't my model running? And you kind of are desensitized to the impacts of it even if you're writing grant proposals talking about impacts of sea level rise you don't allow yourself to stop and think about the implications of this on your own life on your children's lives um because when you do it's just too scary and in order to stay working in this field you have to be healthy you have to be able to cope and so i think it's some combination of knowing that you're doing something um, to, if not solve the problem, at least alert the world to the problem, and then having your your own form of denial where you don't think about the consequences too much, otherwise you wouldn't be able to go to work every day. We use the term hope a lot, and now that's become almost, um, it's almost, you know, people deserve hope. Well, what's the point in having so much hope when the problems are so big and so on? I saw in you quoted Kate Marvel in one thing about, well, maybe we need courage (laughs) instead of hope. We need courage, not hope. Courage (laughs) is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. That's one of my very favorite quotes. And I think a lot of, a lot of, um, a general society sees climate change as kind of an all or nothing, an on off switch. And it isn't. It's a spectrum. It's a spectrum of of increasingly worsening impacts. And we have to accept that some impacts are now unavoidable. We're not the easy end of the spectrum any longer. Um, And to have the courage to deal with that, but also the courage to stop the problem from getting worse, even if it doesn't bring us back to the world in which we all grew up in. We can, it can always get worse worse, which means we can always stop it from getting worse. In the context of this study, 
Um, West Antarctica is in trouble, but East Antarctica has about 10 times as much ice. And we think it is generally stable. In fact, it's slightly increasing mass from increased snowfall, which could be due to climate change. And we think it should generally remain stable as long as emissions don't rise too much further. So, So losing West Antarctica would be losing the battle, but we haven't lost the war. It's only a tenth of Antarctica. Okay. And you did say a big if then. If if emissions stabilize or come down and, and we of sort course, of we're yeah. fighting that one at the moment. But uh... if we're talking about hope, I think I have hope in humanity to uh to get there eventually. It's just a question of speed. I think it was it Churchill. We're doing a lot of quotes. I think it could be Churchill, but we should check this, who said he humans do the right thing, but only after all other options have been exhausted. I think I think we'll get there eventually, slowly. Yeah. Okay, well, on that hopeful note, um, thank you very much for speaking today. It's been, uh, it's been very insightful. It's been great. Thank you for listening. A reminder that episodes appear weeks earlier for YouTube and Patreon members. This is due to my work schedule. However, support for the podcast enables this work to continue.